Make sure you can hear us loud and clear. Hi, Matthew. Just just arrived as well. Hi, okay. Matthew. Okay. Uh, I think that's all. Uh, just make sure that your electronic devices are switched to mute and mode that they aren't speaking in order to ensure quality of sound recording. Uh, advised members to revise agenda has been circulating with one correction. Agenda item six, which is not an oral present, which is not an oral presentation by Rays. Uh, members, are we content with the revised agenda? Great. If members are content to read through the agenda as follows, we have no apologies at present, and I think we're all in attendance. Yes. Uh, draft minutes of proceedings for members of the draft minutes on the 29th of April are at page 5. Are members content with the draft minutes that are accurate with record of proceedings? Okay. Content. Happy to be published on the website. Okay. Content. Uh, matters arising uh, was the Forensic Science Northern Ireland contract. Uh, for members at page 11 is a letter from the Minister of Justice to Jim Alistair uh, answering an AQW in relation to a contract for occupational clothing. Specialist workwear and accessories for forensic science, Northern Ireland. Any comments? I presume we haven't had any response from the minister to last week's letter. No chance. No response. At all. I think the AQW letter answers very clear. It, uh, confirms what some of us were saying last week. If we now move on to the oral evidence, the functioning of government miscellaneous provisions bill, can we invite David and David to come and join us? Ah, David. Good afternoon. David. David squared. Yeah, David indeed. squared. Welcome and thank you very much indeed for coming in to speak to the, speak to the committee today. I uh, just want to say, uh, just for the record, uh, we have in front of us uh, David Sterling, Head of the Northern Ireland Civil Service, and David Hughes, uh, welcome, and uh, Head of the RHI Inquiry Sponsorship Team, Department of Finance. just like to remind members the agenda item is recorded by Hansard. I draw members' attention to the following papers related to the agenda item. Clark's briefing paper at page 14. Uh, Department of Finance response to the function of government miscellaneous provisions bill at page 21. David Sterling. David, can I ask you to make an opening statement? Thank you, Chair. Uh, okay, if I take about five minutes on this. Oh, certainly. Please do. Well, look, thank you. Um, I'll start just by saying that the issue of how ministers, special advisers and the civil service work together within government has been a priority for the returning executive. Uh, and indeed, the way in which we interact together was clearly a focus for the RHI inquiry, which made recommendations in regard to the role of ministers, special advisers, and the civil service. Um, these issues were also addressed by the parties as part of the talks that led to the new decade, new approach uh, agreement in January. And within that, as, as you will know, uh, a work stream on transparency, accountability, and the functioning of the executive was established as part of those talks, and that was chaired by Sue Gray, Permanent Secretary, Department of Finance. Uh, and indeed, the work of that group informed Annex A to the New Decade, New Approach Agreement. Uh, the returning executive has sought to address this particular issue through a revised ministerial code of conduct, a new code of conduct for special advisers, and a newly promoted guidance for ministers. Uh, and alongside that, a new NICS code of ethics has also been agreed, which is currently with trade union side and the civil service commissioners for consultation. Uh, the executive has worked very quickly to put these documents in place once the institutions were restored. And in particular, agreement of the special advisor codes was one of the first decisions taken by ministers in January. Uh, and I can assure the committee there's a very clear desire to ensure that the standards to which ministers special advisors and civil servants here are as high here as anywhere. A key question, obviously, then, is whether these matters should be addressed through legislation or through codes and guidance. Uh, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister's view is that it is more appropriate to address standards of behaviour for ministers through codes of conduct and guidance. Uh, that is generally how these matters are handled in our neighbouring jurisdictions, and it is common across equivalent jurisdictions around the world. It's also worth noting the RHI inquiry when it covered similar ground in recommendations 40 to 43, recommended that necessary changes be made by amending the codes and guidance rather than by legislating. 
Uh, it is, of course, right that there are standards to which ministers are held accountable and guidance on how those standards should be applied in practice. Uh, the disadvantage, uh, in the view of uh, my ministers, of legislating in this area is that some discretion is needed. Uh, standards must be open to interpretation, recognising that there is a difference between deliberate wrongdoing and carelessness or accidental breaches. Uh, the Ministerial Code of Conduct is itself a statutory code and as such carries the kind of authority that I think Mr Alistair seeks. But it is drafted in high-level terms, setting out principles, and that is why it needs to be expanded upon in guidance. And the advantage of that guidance is that it can be updated or revised very simply and quickly. And just coming to a close, uh, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister recognise that the credibility of the codes and guidance depends upon their implementation and the endorsement, of the, sorry, the endorsement by the parties to the New Decade New Approach Agreement should be alongside the strength and codes and the new guidance as evidence of their commitment in this regard. Uh, the new enforcement arrangements will also be crucial. Uh, those arrangements have been set out by the Executive and will be put into practice as soon as possible. And they will ensure that all complaints are considered and, where relevant, investigated by an independent fellow member. So uh, there may be specific issues within the bill relating to the work of the Executive Office um, and that I'm happy to address in response to the Committee's questions. However, I believe that the Committee has asked the Committee for the Executive Office for input uh, and that that Committee will be briefed on this in due course. So I will pause there. Okay. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, Mr Sterling, you tell us we should rely on codes but of course, what our RHI threw up was that though we had codes that, for example, required confidentiality, that required integrity, required honesty, there were flagrant breaches of those codes demonstrated in RHI. Isn't that correct? Uh, certainly, um, the RHI inquiry report did. Uh identify quite a number of issues, which I, I know ministers, and indeed as speaking as head of the civil service, we are keen to ensure don't occur again. So code didn't serve as well in the past, uh, hence my belief, and I remind you the principles of the bill have been approved by the assembly, uh, hence my belief that um, we need more than code. And indeed, on the subject of code of appointment, the RHI report was very clear that those codes should be adhered to vigorously. And yet the first thing the executive did before it ever saw the RHI report was to strip out of the code of appointment all the basic elements about selection of a special advisor. Hardly a confidence-building measure, was it, Mr Stern? Uh, those are obviously matters for ministers, um, and uh, you know I, what I would say is repeat what I think I said in my introductory remarks is that certainly I, I am quite clear that there is a strong desire in ministers uh, to ensure that there is an adherence to the highest standards of uh, behaviour and accountability going forward. Three codes which have previously been breached. Right. Uh, and just on the point, it's not a an all duck or no dinner. You can have legislation and statutory codes. The two are perfectly compatible. You would expect the code to say a lot more than the legislation does. And indeed, we wouldn't have any codes but for the special advisors bill that I brought in 2013. Isn't that correct? Indeed. Yes. Could I take you specifically to clause 1 6 of the bill? Have you got a copy of the bill? Uh, I do, yes. Clause one six is that which says a minister must ensure that only the duly appointed special advisor in the department will exercise the functions, enjoy the access, and receive the privileges of the post, and the permanent secretary must ensure that no person other than a duly appointed special advisor is ordered by the department the cooperation, recognition, and facilitation due to a special advisor. You're no doubt aware as to why that clause is there. 
given what happened in your department? Uh, yeah, yeah, indeed, I understand the intention yes. behind that clause. Yeah. Just could I remind you of what Lord Justice Cochrane had to say, Volume 3, paragraphs 54, 33 to 34, where he was talking about the fact that the 2013 Special Advisors Act prohibited certain people from being special advisors. And then he, he went on to say, as a result, Sinn Féin set up a centralised system under which Aidan McAteer, who did have a prescribed conviction and who is now to be neither appointed nor paid as a civil servant, was engaged to manage and coordinate on a day-to-day -day basis the work of all Sinn Féin special advisers. Paragraph 34. It seems that all of the Sinn Féin SPADs were aware Aidan McAteer was acting as the senior Sinn Féin advisor with the direct authority of the Deputy First Minister, the late Martin McGuinness, uh, in his evidence to the inquiry, Sir Malcolm McKibben, your predecessor, accepted that when he was first introduced to Aidan McAteer, he was told by the then Deputy First Minister he would be working underneath his, Mr McGuinness's, direction and authority. As such, according to Mr Amelior, he was seen as occupying an elevated position with more authority than any other SPADs. And this is what Lord Justice Cochran says. In effect, an individual who could not legally have been appointed as a special advisor and who was not subject to the mandatory code or other relevant codes managed and coordinated those who were employed and paid from public funds as temporary civil servants and who were subject to the relevant legal structures and codes. So, what Clause 1 seeks, seeks to do is to circumvent it is to avoid anyone circumventing the requirements of the law. Is that a bad thing? Uh, I don't think it's for me to comment on whether it's a good or a bad thing. It'll obviously be for this Assembly to decide whether it wishes to uh, support this particular piece of legislation. I think all I would want to say is that um, uh, the First Minister and Deputy First Minister have both appointed three special advisors each, um, and I am not detecting that there's any hierarchy. Um, I'm not talking about hierarchy. I'm talking about the circumvention of someone occupying de facto the position of his bad without being appointed. For example, is Mr. McAteer still on the scene? Uh, I, I'm not aware of. Uh... Is there anyone in Stormont Castle who has the use of the facilities of Stormont Castle who can act as if he were a special advisor, even though he's not a special advisor? The, the only people with access to Stormont Castle are people who are authorised to be there. And could, does that include someone who's not a civil servant, either a special advisor or other, otherwise? I, I'm not aware of anybody. Are there party appointees? I'm not aware of anybody who isn't a civil servant, a special advisor. So it has changed from what it was, it. has it? Uh, well, I, sir, I was not there in the days in which the uh, RHI inquiry... But what would be the problem with you as the Permanent Secretary ensuring that no person other than the duly appointed Special Advisor was afforded the cooperation, recognition and facilitation of someone holding that post? What would be the problem with that? Well, as I say, um, this is not a matter for me to express a view on. You know, it will be for this Assembly no, no, to decide. I'm asking you, is there a problem with that? If you don't want to express a view, that's fine. But is there a problem with a permanent secretary ensuring that? Ensuring, sorry, ensuring, ensuring that? that only a special advisor is co uh, receives the cooperation, recognition, and facilitation due to a special advisor. Is there oh, a sorry, problem? No, I, I, I don't see a problem with that. And would you agree that that would deal conclusively with the issue identified of the abuse that was identified by Lord Justice Cochran? Well, again, it will be for this Assembly to decide whether it feels that that uh, provision is necessary in legislation. Well, um, past events certainly demonstrate it was necessary, don't they? Well, uh, that's a judgment for others. Well, your predecessor me. indicated to the inquiry that he just turned a blind eye. Uh, I think you said that's enough. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Point. Thank you, Chair. Um, Thank you both for, um, for coming and giving evidence today. I just had a couple of slightly broader questions rather than on the, um, I suppose, uh, about the context of the bill. Um, one of the comments you've made is that both in correspondence and today in verbal evidence is that 
your belief or preference is that many of these matters are better handled through um, through guidance rather than legislation. Um, can you give a couple of examples, um, if possible, the last few months, how the updated guidance has affected uh, behaviours, whether it's changed or improved them? Well, I think the first thing I should say is that um, I was expressing the views of my ministers in, in regard to their preference that this should be done through guidance rather than through legislation. Uh, the second thing is, um, obviously, as head of the civil service, um, it's only really since January that I have actually seen the executive in operation. Mm -hmm. So I cannot compare how things are today with how they would have been uh, before the institutions collapsed in uh, 2017. But what I would say is that, um, obviously, since the executive came back, it has had to deal with um, the implementation of the new decade, new approach document. It has had to deal with uh, some difficult budgetary challenges. It's had to deal with the challenge of Brexit. And then, of course, as we all know now, we're having to deal with the uh, worst global pandemic in 100 years. And what I would say is I have seen executive ministers, um, special advisors, and the civil service working very well together uh, to tackle these huge challenges. Uh, and I certainly would not have any concerns about uh, behaviour of any of that group that I described. Are there specific, um, you, you mentioned comparisons with other jurisdictions, probably, I presume you meant within these islands, but then you talked about across the world. Given we have a very particular set of circumstances here, um, because of the nature of devolution, power sharing, um, and a, a sort of divided, you know, a, a divided joint office, um, does that present specific challenges for civil servants, um, you or others, in terms of managing uh, managing relationships with ministers and special advisors? Uh, I have nothing to compare it with, but what I would say is that yes, obviously, our administration here is unique. Um, we have five parties in a coalition, um, and uh, it is. It is challenging to work in a coalition. I think that would be fair comment anywhere. Um, and uh, you know, that requires uh, unique levels of cooperation. Um, and, and by and large, what I'm seeing is that given that we have five parties who in many ways have different ideological, political views on a range of issues, uh, I have been quite impressed by the way people have been prepared to set those issues aside to deal with the major issues that we are actually facing. So um, it is often, you know, the administration is often portrayed as one that is an inherently difficult to manage. And yes, there are challenges, but by and large, we are getting on with it. Like to, to take one example, in dealing with a pandemic, we were just looking, there have been probably going on nearly 200 actions taken by ministers within this executive to deal with this in the space of not quite seven weeks. And I think that's a remarkable achievement for an administration that is still relatively young. Would you say the role of, of special advisors is more or less important in the context of managing um, the unique arrangements that Northern Ireland has? Uh, I, I think special advisors have a very important role to play uh, in this administration. I think special advisors can help to address some of the issues between parties. Um, they, uh, it, it, is, it is useful to have special advisor with whom officials can discuss issues, um, uh, sort of float ideas and see that, you know, special advisors then obviously have an opportunity to discuss those within their parties and at a political level with other parties. And without that, it would be a lot harder to get things done. There might be a, an impression created, notwithstanding the fact that you're right, ministers have had to take lots of quick decisions around COVID-19. There might be the sense that an impression has been created um, since the re-establishment of the institutions that some of the old behaviours around um, decisions being cooked up between perhaps two parties in a certain way, perhaps there's a tendency to, to, to sort of fall back into some of those habits. That's an observation some have made I wouldn't know. but. Um, is that something you would recognise or would you reject it? To have 
as it were, the odd public row, but then a private means of resolving things? Uh, well, what I would say is the First Minister and Deputy First Minister from day one, from the Saturday that the agreement was reached and the institutions were re-established, uh, both said to me that they wanted this to be a well-functioning executive and they wanted the three smaller parties to be given their place and to be uh, a full, you know, to play a full part in a partnership executive. Uh, obviously, um, there will always be tensions within a five-party coalition, uh, and there are two parties that are clearly larger than the other three. But within that dynamic, I think there is a genuine desire <coughs> that we should work as a collective partnership and particularly in dealing with the issues around the pandemic. That is what I see on a daily basis. I could chair just one or two further questions. Just um, one, thank you. Um, uh, this may be a, a moot question. I believe, um, Mr Sterling, you, had a, you were a relatively senior servant, I believe, in the previous incarnation of the executive, as in pre-2002-03. Is that, is that, am I I'm right in saying that you, had, you would have had significant dealings with at, at ministerial and executive level at that in time? In the first executive? In the first executive, so 98 to 2002. Yes. Uh, I joined the Department of Finance in March 2000, so I would have worked for uh, Mark Durkin and then Sean Farron um, before the institutions collapsed uh, in 2002. I suppose a broad, another broad question. Could you give us how do you think um, special advisors what comparison would you make between the function of special advisers in the period 98 to 2002, the bit that you worked with ministers on, and, and that was the Department of Finance and Personnel, of course, so you would have had policy oversight of, the, of, of civil service and SPAD governance. How did it differ then to what happened um, 2007, 2017, and then, I guess, since January? What were the specific differences? That's quite a question. Um, uh, you're, you're asking me to arrange over events that go back 20 years now. And, uh, I suppose, uh, sorry, I'll narrow it down just because of the, the chair is indulging me. Yeah, I am I'm indulging you a lot at the moment. One, 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 I, will, I'll, I will just try and. Um, did SPADs play a greater role? Do, did SPAD, do SPADs now play a greater role than they did in that first executive? I think all I would say is that each, each executive has been different. And that simply reflects the different personalities you had in ministerial roles at the time. Uh, it also reflects the different uh, personalities you had as special advisors. Uh, in the same way, I'm sure, if you looked at any other jurisdiction, the actual way in which uh, government functioned would probably differ um, <coughs> as time evolves and as personalities change. Um, I, I, I wouldn't want to be drawn into, you know, What's one period better than the other? I think I would just say they were different. Um, Thank I'll you. write my memoirs. I'll uh, look forward to it. I'm sure Sue Gray has something to say about that. Sure. Uh, thanks, Chair. Just a quick question, David. Um, has the publishing of the RHA um, recommendations meant that revisiting the revised guidelines and codes? Uh, yes, certainly they, they, they have been looked at again. And I think, again, ministers, in agreeing the codes and the guidance, we're very clear that that is not something they do or did as a one-off. Uh, I think they recognise that uh, guidance, and again, this is one of the advantages of guidance, is guidance can be amended quickly and will need to be amended in light of behavioural changes, contextual changes uh, over time. So certainly, I think... There's a very clear desire to make sure that guidance remains very much uh, alive and um, relevant to the particular uh, circumstances that we face going forward. And certainly speaking on behalf of the civil service, that's something we will want to do as well in terms of our code of ethics, etc. Okay, thank you. Thanks, uh, sir. Yes, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, David, for coming here today to give evidence on this. Uh, uh, and again, you know, you, you can see you're in a difficult uh, position, yet you're still trying to answer the questions as thoroughly as you can, so I appreciate that. But we want to hear from David Sterling, the head of the civil service, with all your vast experiences, Matthew has alluded to, uh, through all those years. 
Uh, I suppose, can I take you through the difference between legislation and codes of conduct uh, and standard operating procedures? Surely it's better to have down in law the protections required to protect your staff in the civil service from unscrupulous politicians and spads who may want to influence something uh, that had a best interest. I actually think if you want to have a well-functioning administration, the most important thing is that you have ministers, civil servants, advisors who have a mutual trust and respect for each other, um, who have a, a, a clear desire to work together to deliver the best possible outcomes for the people we serve. Um, if those relationships are not good, I think my experience would be it doesn't particularly matter whether you've got legislation or guidance, you will struggle to have a healthy, well-functioning administration. Um, uh, so, you know, yes, legislation gives you stronger protections, um, but if you are in a position where you're relying on that, I think it suggests to me that you have got a pretty fundamental problem. Do you not think that we have had a very fundamental problem over the last number of years? Uh, it has certainly been, you know, if, if I look back over the last 10 years or so, yes, it, it, it's quite clear that the administration has faced uh, quite significant challenges. I spoke in the chamber uh, at the second stage and I talked about, uh, and it was an issue that was raised by a member saying that members don't, really shouldn't bring legislation. This should be a, a decision for the executive, which I totally and utterly disagree with. Uh, but, but do you think that with codes of conduct that may well be decided upon by an executive, it, it will be much broader to allow the Assembly to produce something, by way of legislation of course, that resolves these issues and gets us onto a better place. And not only individual MLAs, but actually the executive could bring forward their own piece of legislation, call it a reform bill. And I, I spoke to this in the second stage. Do you think, as head of civil service, that the Northern Ireland executive should produce a reform bill? Um, uh, dealing with all aspects of the RHI inquiry and everything that born out of it. Well, the, obviously the executive has agreed to set up a subcommittee to look at the RHI recommendations. I don't think it would be right for me as a civil servant to preempt the conclusions that that committee might reach. <clears throat> yeah, but just as an update, uh, could you just inform the committee where we are with that subcommittee? Because again, that was one of the big strands we'll be discussing pre the reformation of the executive. Where are we on that? Um, I maybe look to David. I think it has been set up, but I'm not the, sure that it's met. No, the terms of reference have been agreed, um, uh, and uh, but it hasn't met because it was those those were agreed just at the very point at which um, all attention was going to be passed on to the pandemic. And I think that's just a reflection of the circumstance we're in at the minute. Like to be honest, um, there's very little work going on at the moment which isn't related to dealing with the pandemic. But I'm sure it might be useful for this committee if we manage to see a copy of the terms of reference, because that might be useful for informing us of the validity of the bill going forward. I don't see any difficulty with that. Thank you. With, with regards to SPADs uh, and the different SPADs for the different departments, are you confident now that there are very clear demarcation lines uh, and that each SPAD is accountable for their own actions and the minister responsible for that spot. But there are no crossovers uh, with regards to uh, <coughs> individual parties and a rank structure around spots. And has that manifested itself, if that is the case, a rank structure, has that manifested itself in any cases since post RHA? It's not an issue that has been raised with me as a problem. Obviously, 
Uh, departmental ministers have one special advisor each. There are three on each side in the executive office. Um, and as I say, I, I haven't had any. Uh, nobody has come to me and said there's a particular problem of that nature to me. That's not really saying that it hasn't happened. No, well, I, I, saying that you just right, haven't had sight of. I, I'm not aware that what you describe uh, has happened or is happening. Uh, on the clauses, I can't just remember off the top of my head. The, the clause with regards to the uh, use of official systems, clause nine, is it? Uh, yes. And and people using civil service using personal equipment. Do you think that we need something like this, either in legislation or codes of conduct, to make sure that you're sure that there are no slippages, leakages, or any other aspects whereby civil service could be doing something underhand or unscrupulous or for their own interests or for the interests of family members and so on? Is it not right and proper that you would have a set of standard operating procedures that, that basically lay out what is acceptable and what's not? Now, I get it that you could be in an area and it's fast moving. You could be in a crisis mode and that something has to be sent quickly. Uh, so I do believe that there has to be reasonableness injected into that uh, as a defence. But do you see the need for something like this? Uh, it goes back to the whole, and again, this is global with regards to personal email accounts and everything else. Um, but, but do you see the real need? Have you been frustrated any time in your experience in your career that, to say, to suggest that this isn't badly needed? We need to have a set of standard operating procedures to make sure people know, your staff, what's acceptable and what's not when you're communicating using devices. Forms. Well, uh, obviously, speaking about the civil service, um, there are already very strong guidelines about use of official devices, um, the use of official systems, and indeed, it's made very clear in the civil service handbook that breach of that could be misconduct, could even be gross misconduct. So you could lose your job if you breach that. So that is a pretty strong sanction already. How many civil service personnel have lost their job over this? Uh, I couldn't answer that offhand, but I, I'm fairly sure that people have been dismissed for um, a breach of uh, uh, communication type of yeah that sort of thing, um, accessing inappropriate material, you know, a, a range of things like that. Could, could that be got? Could that could the answer to that question be got without too much bother? As yes, we'll find, that out. we'll find that out for you. Okay, thank you. And then, as far as ministers are concerned, it is in the guidance to the ministerial code uh, that uh, use of official systems, etc., should be, uh, you know, again, needs to be properly managed. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Do you accept, Mr. Sterling, that despite your much vaunted um, uh, codes of conduct, that the the behaviour of SPADs from all parties in the last administration was utterly appalling. Uh, I, I'm not going. You know, we, we have the RHI inquiry um, has obviously reported, and it, the report is there. Uh, I think I prefer to look forward. And uh, well, you've seen the overwhelming support for Jim's Mr. Allister's bill in the Assembly. You've seen the truly awful performance of SPADs under your much vaunted codes of conduct. On what basis did you walk into this room today and say that it should be a continuation of a failed system of legislation? What authority had you to say that today? Well, what I was expressing was the view of my ministers that the preference. Which ministers? The First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. The First Minister and the Deputy First Minister have said that they want, do not want a bill, they want codes of conduct. Uh, their preference is that there would be codes of conduct rather than legislation. Even though the overwhelming majority of the Assembly supported the second reading of the bill which demanded statutory uh, powers rather than codes of conduct? Uh, I'm, I'm expressing the, the views that I have got, yeah. And even though representatives of the First Minister spoke enthusiastically in favour of Mr Allister's bill, I mean, did you take your soundings before or after the second reading of the bill? Um, well, look, 
I'm simply repeating what, no, I, what I've said. What, what, when did you take your soundings on, whether, on, on the First Minister's approach to the bill? Was it before or after the second reading? Um, it, it's recently, yeah. How recent is recent? Um, well, in preparation for this. Look, I, I, I will double check that point, right. just in case there's any confusion right. there. Secondly, pursuant to Mr. Alistair's question, you know what was going on, and you were permanent secretary for part of the time. You know that there was de facto a second tier of SPADs operating from an office in West Belfast. Can you give us, this committee, on the record a categorical assurance that that is not continuing at the moment in Stormont Castle? Um, all I can say is that I work for uh, First Minister and Deputy First Minister. They are supported by three special advisers on each side. Uh, and I have seen nothing of the nature of what you have described to me. Did you see it when it was going on? Uh, I didn't work in the old office of the First Minister, Deputy First Minister. Were you aware it was going on? Um, I, I didn't work in that department. Were you aware it was going on? Uh, that's, that's, I think we've had, the, we've had the answer. He doesn't want to answer. Uh, that's not the question. He's given the answer the rest of it. He's hiding. Yeah, that's it. Uh, Dr. Rose, uh, Sean Yee, you're very welcome here this evening. August Blahis, Virginia, the Ratchet Foster, and thank you for your statement as well. Um, and I know that in around this whole issue of SPAS and the likes of it, not only in their appointment, but then in, uh, in an inverted commas, the disciplinary process uh, in relation to the SPAS, and as much as that they're temporary civil servants. Uh, and that, uh, could you maybe expand on that uh, as? As far as special advisors are concerned, and uh, what it is that one would recommend there. And I noticed too, just in saying that, that, uh, that words have already been used here in terms of reasonableness and flexibility, and in particular when it comes to the appointment of SPADs and so on. Is that expectation uh, on the part of the Minister that uh, they have that confidence in the person that they have there as their SPAD? And it's probably in that context as well, too, that where both reasonableness and flexibility. Required. So, firstly, maybe could you expand just on what your current thinking is on um, the way that one ensures that SPADs adhere to uh, the expectations of the role that they've been appointed to? Okay, well, um, I think, as I said in my introduction, one of the first things that the executive did when it came in in January was to introduce a new special advisor uh, code of conduct. Uh, and within that, one of the significant changes was it was made clear that special advisors were accountable to, accountable and responsible to their minister. Um, and again, special advisors are required to adhere to the civil service code of conduct. Uh, and if there's any breach of that, obviously it will be the responsibility of the minister to uh, ensure that um, there's accountability in respect of any such breach. But certainly the the. The, the, the guidance makes clear that special advisors should um, adhere to those standards set out in the Civil Service Code. And, uh, but, but I know that you've vaguely mentioned as well, too, like the, is there an expectation that they'll be sort of developing um, a code there uh, in relation to special advisors, we'll say, on the part of the Civil Service themselves? Um, well, we, as I say, we have the, the there is the revised code for special advisors and uh, that will be kept under review and if there's any need to improve it then I think it will be but at the moment I don't think there are any plans for any further amendment to it. The, the um, special advisors would need to abide by the Civil Service Code of Ethics which is yet to be finalised also to the Code of Conduct which is specific to special advisors but the standards expected of civil servants in all areas um, those apply to special advisors, with the exception of those, those um, the uh, impartiality, the requirements of impartiality and objectivity. Um, and as was said earlier on in this session, um, the executive will look at the codes in light of the RHI inquiry uh, recommendations. Not having said that they've fin finished the revision, if that's if there's further revision needed, but that that was the point made. These these codes can be reviewed, revised, and updated as appropriate. Just a point of clarification, 
Obviously, as special advisors now have to adhere by the Civil Service Code of Conduct. Do they sign anywhere to that effect, that they've read and understood the well, Civil Service Code of Conduct? It's, it's part of their uh, letter of appointment, it's part of their contractual relationship. So they actually physically sign on the line and said, I have read and understand the I've rules and regulations as led down in the Civil Service Code of Conduct. I've accepted the appointment on the basis of the, the, the terms of the appointment, it includes the Civil Service Code. There. And that's very clearly let out in the contract? Yes, that's, that's part of the, the, the appointment process. And if I just could uh, finish on that, that uh, to imply that it needs to be legislated for in a sense, if anything, it would also uh, imply to uh, that lack of trust or confidence uh, in the Minister in the first instance to take responsibility for his special adviser and ensuring that they adhere to court of practice. Sorry, can, can you repeat the question? I'm just, just make sure I'm clear. Uh, that it would imply a lack of confidence or trust in the minister uh, if one had to legislate uh, for uh, the special adviser as such in terms of uh, adhering to a uh, code of practice. It's already happened. Well, certainly, um, certainly the, the onus is upon the minister and it's placed, that's placed upon the minister through the ministerial code of conduct their responsibility for the, the management and the discipline of the special advisor. And we haven't seen the ministerial code yet, have we? Um, it was published, yes. Yeah, it has been published. Yeah. Yeah. But revised by what we were expecting through the new decade, new approach? Obviously, the ministerial code um, needs to be um, uh, legislated for uh, there will need to be amendment to Schedule 4 of the Northern Ireland Act. And um, First Minister and Deputy First Minister have asked the Secretary of State to do that. That's one of those things that's just been held up by the current uh, pandemic crisis. Um, but that will probably happen sometime later this year. Chair, could I make that's one just quick point? Just quick one. Um, you tell us there are these codes. If they breach them, the Minister is responsible for it, of course. Past experience tells us in the Department of Finance when there was a Department of Finance official's recommendation that a special advisor, Mr Brimstone, should be disciplined, the minister stepped in and quoised it. Maybe you were permanent secretary at that stage. I don't uh, No, I wasn't. Right. Um, so it's all very fine to have lots of nice codes. But on the discipline side, if the, civil, if the special advisor as a civil servant who breaches it is not subject to the disciplinary procedures of the civil service, but has the protection of only his minister, who appointed him, being able to discipline him. And it is a joke, isn't it? Well, it, I think it just reflects that unique relationship that there is between a minister and a special <laughs> advisor. Uh, uh, we're on time. Lisa, sorry, I sort of cut across you there. Have you finished? Thanks, yeah, thank you. Ah. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Thanks very much. Thank you for coming today. Um, I'm just looking at. I know that within that executive office, they have the upper, They have the right to employ up to eight spads. I mean, I'm coming from from listening to what you said about the code of conduct. I, I just can't figure out uh, and the civil service. Do you find that there's a need for it, or how can you justify that? Well, at the moment, um, only three on each side have been appointed, and each has a specific range of responsibilities. And uh, you know that there there are quite a wide range of uh, issues to be dealt with. So you know, I wouldn't have any particular issue with it. Right. And I suppose what I'm going back to then is that are you aware of the arrangements in other jurisdictions? Uh, for for the appointments of a special advisor, uh, I wouldn't be expert in them, um, oh. but uh, certainly the, the the special advisors code that we have now is almost identical, I think, to right. the Whitehall special advisors code. There wouldn't be many departures from it that I'm aware of. No, it's it, the the treatment of special advisors because they are, in the first instance, civil servants. Then there's the the requirement is then very similar in terms of the standards required of civil servants. 
and the code of conduct that's specific to special advisers is very similar here and in the other UK jurisdictions, certainly. Okay, well, I'm no expert on it either, but I, I do believe, and I think I'll stand to be corrected, that there's more in Northern Ireland uh, uh, special advisers than there are in uh, any of the other jurisdictions or the home counties here. And I'm just looking at it from taking the code of conduct and t taking the way that that, um, that, that, that that is set there for that. If I was trying to set out, and I was yourself, and it's not an attack, it's just looking at it from a business point of view, I would be making sure that where the job could be done by one, it would be done by one. I understand that those rules have to come in from it, but how can you defend it? How can we defend that you need eight when I know that there isn't eight anywhere else? Well, there are only six in the executive office. But they have the right to have eight. Uh, indeed, and they've chosen not to exercise that right at the moment. So just a, just a point of cl clarity, and obviously special advisors have different pay bands. Is there a hierarchy amongst the three special advisors within the uh, office of OFM or DFM? Is there a, it, it seems strange that one would be at a higher pay band, one would be at a middle pay band, and one would be at a lower pay band. Is there a degree of hierarchy amongst special advisors? Uh, as far as the three on each side and the executive office are concerned, each has their own set of responsibilities and areas that they look after. But they're all paid uh, different pay bands, aren't they? Yeah. I, I, I wasn't involved in selling the pay. The pay is set in the Department of Finance. And I think there's a range of issues that are taken into account in, in setting that. Um, I don't know, David, you want I'm, to... I'm, I, before I came, I just checked what it was the, the, the pay that was published um, and in uh, the First Minister's office two are on the same pay and one is on a, a lower pay and in the Deputy First Minister's office two are on the same pay and one is on a slightly lower pay so um, there isn't a clear hierarchy um, and each special advisor is accountable to the Minister who appoints okay. and just for my own um as well, if you can help me as well, David, that the uh, Northern Ireland Civil Service, your response states that no appointments have been made under this provision uh, by this administration. And I was wondering, uh, does the witness believe that this response addresses any issues that there is within the TEA or within the DOF? Sorry, in respect of what? In, in respect to what that clause, I'm talking about the, your clause three of, uh, of the prerogative power that. appointment. Oh, the prerogative power? Yes. Um, yeah. Um, Just in line with there being uh, the, the capability of employing eight, and you tell me that there were six there, but what I'm really trying to get to is, Good does one. the response not raise any objections to the clause? Well, look, uh, so clause three, it is supported. You yeah, do support well, it. it. I, it's not for me to okay. support or not support it. Um, it is there. It's kept under review. Um, it hasn't been used, as far as I'm aware. In fact, I'm pretty sure it hasn't been used since 2016. Yeah. Gemma. Gemma. Sorry, no, I'm okay. I have no questions. Are you sure? <laughs> yeah, I've been I'm going to have to get Paul to ask a very short one, yes, and then sir. Matthew a very short one. Just on Minister's point and Jim's point uh, to progress that, uh, with regards to ministerial protection for SPADs if they break the code. What happens if SPAD is actually the line manager of the minister? What happens if, in the organisation or the political party, SPAD is actually a senior authority to the minister? The, the, the code of conduct and the ministerial protection is a nonsense. I'm, I'm not aware of such a scenario. Not. We, we, you, you did say yourself that we live in a very unique place. We do have a party that is, let, is wedded to a paramilitary force with an army council functioning. It could happen. Sorry, to the Chair, can I, can I challenge that? Yeah, can I challenge that in every respect? Back that money's finished, you can come straight back on that. It's true. So given, given the uniqueness of Northern Ireland, which we've already agreed, surely you need protection for a scenario such as that? Uh, as I say, I'm not aware of such a scenario at all, and I don't really think it would be appropriate for me to comment on such a thing. Yes, and through the Chair, just, uh, I think it's despicable that a member should uh, 
like that allegation, because I know that exactly he's implying that it is our party that are wedded to a paramilitary force, Correct. which yeah. we are yeah. not. Yeah. Sinn Féin is totally and absolutely a political party that are committed yeah. to the peace the process in every respect. And I have to say, too, that this particular member never misses any opportunity that he can find for himself uh, to make this type of allegation, this type of slanderous allegation that he implies. Uh, and uh, I think it's despicable that that should have been raised here uh, on this occasion as well, too, and that been addressed to the head of our civil service. Have you not read you the government Mr. security in this sense? Thank you, I've got a, a very brief one. Um, uh, Mr. Sterling, you mentioned before that the volume that the Northern Ireland Civil Service, the machinery is working with. I just wanted to check. Um, that being said, how often since uh, January has the subcommittee on Brexit met, and when is it next due to meet? Uh, I can't tell you how many times it has met, but it is, it's a few weeks since it has met, simply because of pressure of other business. But I think the intention is certainly that the um, uh, executive will meet to discuss Brexit issues next week. It's le less than five, so it would be sort of less than a handful of times that it's met. Uh, it's probably in the region of five, six. I, I, I honestly can't. Matthew, I think that's it. more a question for the executive committee. Uh, yeah. Dave, just before I finish, up uh, both David. You've mentioned quite a few times unique circumstances we have in Northern Ireland. And we have to be very clear that the only reason we're looking for a legislative process rather than relying on a code of ethics or guidance is because, quite frankly, the previous code of ethics and guidance have completely failed. Because we would not have got in a situation in Northern Ireland where we would have had a collapse of a government for three years and a major public inquiry unless we'd have a situation where codes and guidance were actually being followed. And I know it's best, and I know Matthew will probably back me up on this one, it's the best custom and practice of UK PLC that we don't go for legislation because we are expected to follow codes and guidance. One of the things that's become clear both through the RHI report and I think from the flavour of most of the questioning you have here is the concerns that the normal processes of codes and guidance weren't followed, which is why we reached this situation. So from your position as the professional head of the civil service, can you outline how, by just using processes of codes and guidance, that we could be in a situation in Northern Ireland where we couldn't, without a legislative process, revisit the problems we've had with RHI? Well, because I just I, the word that you kept on using was unique, so we're not dealing with the same circumstances we, we deal with on the rest of these islands. So that's I would like your response to that, please. Well, within the um, the structure that the framework, if you like, that this guidance uh, is designed to provide, there certainly are mechanisms to ensure there would be accountability, including sanctions for ministers, special advisers, and civil servants. However, if this assembly chooses that, you know, to, uh, if the assembly in a sense decides that it wants something stronger, well then, so be it. Um, but I'm simply reflecting um, the, the preferences that were expressed at the executive whenever they were, these were, they were considering these matters. But it is, uh, it is a matter for the members of this assembly to decide. Okay. Oh. David, any further comments? Uh, no, we don't think so. No. Uh, we have a series of we had a series of other questions that have been written into sort of the brief as well. We'd like to forward to you for uh, reflection on and coming back to us potentially to uh, give us some more <coughs> advice and guidance as we come through when we're uh, considering the consideration of this bill. Uh, if you'd be content to do those, we'll forward those on through the clerk. Yeah. Okay. And thank you both of you. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now, Tim, we move on to the written evidence for the functioning of government miscellaneous provisions bill. I remind members that the agenda item is still being continued to be recorded by Hansard. Draw members' attention to the following papers related to the agenda item. Clark's briefing on page 37. Uh, written, to the committee's, uh, written evidence to the committee's call for evidence, page 40 to 80. Correspondence from, correspondence from the committee for the executive office regarding its plan to respond to the bill, page 81. Letter from Jim Allister, Department of Justice Permanent Secretary, in response to the submission received by the committee by the Department, page 82. 
A letter from Jim Alistair to the Permanent Secretary of the Department of Finance asking for a meeting to discuss further issues on the bill, page 84. I to remind members on the 1st of May, the committee was asked to agree that the chairperson make with the bill sponsors to propose a handling plan for the committee stage for the bill. The following members agreed, myself, Paul, and the two Jims, Pat and Musa. I'd like your formal agreement for the committee to agree for the chairperson bill sponsor to meet prior to the meeting on the 6th of 2020 to discuss the handling plan the committee stage of the functioning of government bill. We've already done that. Are we content? Agreed. Form the members, the chairperson of the bill sponsor met as agreed. The draft plan was circulated to members at the start of the meeting. Have you all seen a copy of that? Sean? Chairman, yep. you, uh, you won't have seen it. Were you emailed one? I was, yeah. Okay. Thanks for that. Okay. Uh, have we any comments? I'd like your six year agreement for the handling plan for the bill. All those favour say aye. Aye. Any against? Uh, seek agreement for the action suggested in the clerk's paper to be taken. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Uh, we'd like to seek, seek agreement to schedule oral evidence from the Strategic Policy and Reform Division of the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. Jim, would you like to add? Yeah, I thought in the written submissions, uh, Felicity Houston, the former Public Appointments Commissioner, made some interesting points, not least about the office that she previously held. And since this is a functioning of government uh, committee, our, our bill, I would have thought that bill is capable, through further amendment, of dealing with the issues that she has raised. So I would have thought it might be useful to hear from her as a witness. Uh, I thought Sam McBride also made interesting points about whistleblowers, etc. So uh, it might be, uh, and other provisions that might be needed, it might be useful to hear from him. Comments? I've been off here. Yeah. A proposal on the table. We also want Felicity Houston and Sam McBride. Sam McBride, if they're willing. Yeah. Those in favour say aye. Aye. Any against? I ask members of any further oral evidence sessions they wish to schedule at this stage, apart from that's already been briefed. No? Uh, so, sorry, right, Chair. Go ahead, I, Matthew. Um, just on um, the, there may be one or two people I think that would be. so. On the bill, so the Institute for Government um, might be an interesting party to take um, evidence, either in either written or verbal form. They are non-partisan think tank. Um, they are based in London. Um, it may be, you know, that uh, I think they would have interesting um, input in relation to uh, that they monitor these things, not just in the UK but more broadly. Yeah. Great. Content? Written. Uh, ask for written, Matthew. Uh, well, I mean, depending on. Okay. I think that it would be quite good to get. Initially. Yeah. Yeah. So, what was that, sorry? So we're content. Written and written. Written, initially. yes. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Uh, move on to item number six in the agenda research, the functioning of government uh, miscellaneous provisions bill. I'd like to draw my members' attention to the following paper related to the agenda item the raised paper on page 86. And I'd like to seek agreement to receive a briefing from the raised researcher who drafted this paper. I thought it was a quite a useful uh, paper. Are we content? Great, yeah. Great. I can move on now to SL1, uh, the Rates Cronus Emergency Relief Regulation, uh, Northern Ireland 2020. Mind you, the agenda items are recorded by Hansard. Four members official from the Department of Finance will be in attendance to provide oral evidence in response to any further questions should they arise. Alan, are you on the link? Alan. You're out there. <laughs> Crash the vehicle. I'll count, I'll count to five. Mr. Bronte, are you out there? <laughs> uh, right. Gentlemen, do we have any issues that we wished we would have wished to raise with Alan Bronte? Take that, I will take that as a no. Well, I mean, there were, I mean, a couple of um, points uh, regarding um, uh, level of planning for future policy decisions once we are through the um, through the worst of this pandemic, chair. So it would be interesting to know what um, uh, who and you know how much resource there is in the department for. 
planning for a you know an economic response. We know, as we d discussed yesterday in the budget debate. Oh. Alan, is that you? Yep, it's Alan here. Ah, Alan. Sir, go ahead. A question from uh, a question from Matthew for you. Hello, Alan. Can you, can Hi. I am I coming through clearly? Yep. Thank you. Um, my question um, uh, is less in relation to the immediate subordinate legislation in front of us, um, but it is a, a relevant one. How much resource is being devoted? Is any resource being devoted to planning for a broader economic response that includes um, uh, an examination of how the non-domestic rating system works? Well, our major concern is, is addressing the, the, the immediate needs. So, you know, in terms of uh, current requirements, it's really to get these two pieces of legislation through. It's also to bring through two other pieces of legislation um, that the Minister has flagged up, which were very important, back to business and the ATM. But our immediate concern around the minute is in terms of the emergency relief, the coronavirus emergency relief. That is our, that all the effort is going into that at the minute to a legislate for the three months holiday, also to review the period from um, July forward and see what's what's necessary. To, so to be honest, uh, uh, most of our efforts is, is going into that. Matthew, would you be content for a written response to that? Your question. Yes, um, there are a couple of other written points that I'd, that I'd quite like to raise um, that may not be um, uh, may not be one for the immediate yep. uh, hearing. Yeah, can I ask, Alan, thank you very much for your attendance here, uh, for, for linking in to us. Yep. Uh, this is a negative resolution, uh, and you have the 21-day rule. Uh, but does that, would that hinder, then, the Minister making a further decision on, let's say, extension or some other, some other aspect of the rates? No, I I don't think so, Mr. Free. So, what we want to do today is to um, answer any questions in relation to this uh, emergency relief regulation uh, for, for the three-month holiday. Um, if if it were decided by the executive to, to to bring forward further relief, then I wouldn't see that as an issue. We would bring back through the committee uh, an amendment to this regulation if it was necessary to felt necessary to extend it. Okay. Thank you. Okay, okay. Are we content? Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you very much indeed, Alan. Uh, um, and and, the, and, there's the, the, and also the uh, SBRR bill, the regulation as well. Are you content with that? No, we haven't got that far yet. <laughs> <laughs> You're not getting away with that easy. Okay. Okay, um, I would like to advise members this rule is subject to negative resolution procedure before the Assembly. Inform members it's anticipated the rule will come into operation as soon as possible in order to address issues facing business as a result of the COVID outbreak. I advise members that it's the committee's opportunity to consider the policies set out in the SL1 as they're not possible to amend this once the rule has been made and laid in the Assembly Business Office. I'd like to draw members' attention to the clerk's briefing paper on page 113 and the SL1 rates Corona Emergency Relief Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 on page 115. I would like to draw members' attention to the purpose of the statutory rule is to make provision to provide emergency rate relief in order to help business ratepayers who are facing financial impacts arising from the serious uh, health issues caused by COVID-19. The draft rule will intervene for a three-month period in order to provide 100% rate relief for businesses. This emergency policy intervention will apply to all business properties with the exception of public bodies and utility providers, statutory undertakers. Are there any further issues in relation to this rule? Gentlemen? Gemma? No, no, okay. Okay. In that case, I would like your agreement and if agreement to the statutory will. Agreed? Agreed. Therefore, the Committee for Finance has considered Department of Finance proposal for subordinate legislation the rates Coronavirus Emergency Relief Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 and has no objection to the policy implications of the proposed legislation at this stage. Well, agreed? Agreed. agreed. And I move on to item number eight, uh, SL1, the Rates Small Business Hereditament Relief Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020. The agenda item is recorded by Hansard. 
The rule is subject to negative res resolution procedure before the Assembly. Inform members that anticipated that the rule will come to operation as soon as possible so the statutory provision is in place for rates bills issued in June 2020. Rates bills for households and businesses have been postponed for 2021 as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is the committee's opportunity to consider the policy set out in the SL1 and it is not possible to amend this once the rule has been made and laid in the Assembly Business Office. I draw members' attention to the following papers related to the item. Our briefing paper on page 119 and the SL1 Rate Small Business Heredament Relief Amendment Regulations Northern Ireland 2020 at page 120. I remind you that it's the purpose of the draft rule is to extend the Small Business Rates Relief Scheme up to the 31st of March 2021. Ladies and gentlemen, do you have any issues you wish to raise with Mr. Bronte? No. Jim? Yeah. Uh, obviously, we, we've. You was pat in before me. Well, no, no, you um, were Jim. Yeah. Sorry. Obviously, uh, we've no problem at all with the principle of extending the small business rates relief issue. But as Mr. Bronte is, is one of the most senior officials, in the rest of the UK, the amnesty stroke holiday for rates April, May, and June is three months in Northern Ireland, it's for a year in the rest of the United Kingdom. Does he have any insight as, as to whether there's a plan to extend the rates amnesty beyond the end of June for the thousands of small businesses that are struggling very badly at the moment? Well, obviously, the small business relief is for the full year. So this, this particular SL1 is, is really the, the S, SBRR that's been in place for quite a number of years. In fact, I spoke to the committee back in February, uh, updating the committee on, on the three amendments that were, that were put through when the Assembly was not, in, not, not functioning. Um, and so this basically, this SBRR rolls over SBRR for the full year, um, and uh, that's, that's the purpose of this SL1. Yes, I, I do accept that. But do you have the insight into what's going on in land and property services? Are there any plans being made to extend the three-month rates amnesty for small businesses in Northern Ireland further, as is happening in the rest of the UK? So, it, it, in, in many ways, it takes me back to the previous SL1. I'm happy to go back to it. So, the, so the previous SL1 uh, is is a three-month uh, rate holiday for all businesses, not just small businesses. It's for and it's for all businesses. The very big distinction between what has been put here in place in Northern Ireland and what's been put in place in England, Scotland, and Wales separately. So in Northern Ireland, we have given a three-month holiday for for every business, whereas in England, um, Scotland, and Wales, it has been to retail, hospitality, and leisure. Um, and that I think uh, was the good, was the right call uh, because manufacturing, coppers service industry were very badly affected, have been very badly affected by COVID-19. And so, so the three-month holiday in the previous SL1 deals with every business. Um, the executive will have to take the call now to decide, so what does, is there further, further relief needed from July onwards? And the minister has indicated that he is looking at that and has brought in Gareth Harrington from Ulster University to to give an economic overview, to inform the executive and inform the minister as to whether something further is required from July onwards, and should it be tailored uh, to the poor, the particular need is. Okay, thanks very much indeed. And uh, thanks very much, Chair. And again, I'm going to go back to what I, I just raised yesterday in the chamber here, and it's to do with the. Uh, I, I hear what you're saying on this SL1 here, and on the. I'm looking at the £51,000 threshold or cut-off point that was on that. But what I'm, trying to get, uh, what I'm trying to get from you is, do you have plans or proposals to further extend this scheme, including larger businesses? And can we look at those? I know it may well not be a, a, to a topic with yourself, but within that, your department, are you looking at businesses that have fallen through this net? I know that you're dealing here with the three months, but surely you must at least be talking and thinking about other businesses that find themselves really facing the cliff edge at the minute, and there will be no way back from them if we don't answer them now. Well, the two grants are not 
they're not the responsibility of, of my department. They're the responsibility for the, for the uh, economy department. Um, so you know, the, both the 10,000 grants and the 25,000 grants, that's part of the Department of Economy. Um, I would have to just to repeat the previous answer effectively, which is that the, you know, the minister is looking to see what relief is necessary uh, with the period from July forward. Uh, the economy minister is looking at to see where, where the grants have been applied and where the cracks are, and I, I can't really comment any further than that. But in terms of rate relief, um, the minister is looking to see uh, what tailored relief, uh, what specific relief is required from, from July onwards. And say so we've got this opportunity now because we, we did support all businesses up to this point, and I think that was the right call, and, and I think others have recognised that. And now we have to look and see from July onwards, uh, now with the view, you know, with a cl slightly clearer view where we are, uh, and also in, in line with when the government, announced, when the executive announces uh, how, how we will get business back to back back in business again, uh, and how we will get the wheels rolling again, uh, what rate relief is necessary. There's no doubt that it has had a, a serious impact and will continue to have that on the economy. Okay, thank, thank uh, you. Rate thank relief. You. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Alan. Alan, thank you very much indeed. Okay. Thank you very much indeed, members. And because we're uh, now looking at a bit of time compression, what we need to do. Uh, if I'd like to seek your agreement uh, that the members agree that the Committee for Finance has considered the Department of Finance's proposal for subordinate legislation, the rate small business rediment relief amendment regulations to Northern Ireland 2020. And there's no objection to the policy implications of the proposed legislation at this stage. All those in favour say aye. 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 Any against? Right. Move on to agenda number 99. Thank you, Alan. Okay, thank you. Cheers. Uh, moving on to Chairperson's Business number 9. Uh, inform members the Permanent Secretary has suggested a date of the 10th of June for oral evidence to the committees on the members' first day brief. Are we content? Aye. Great. Uh, Agenda number number 10, correspondence. Uh, I remind members, due to the tight timings of the agenda today, that Clark emailed members on the 4th of May proposing a list of table papers suggested actions against the event for consideration. Uh, the table list of suggested actions is page 3. Are we content to agree with Mr. the clerk's Chairman, paper, Jim? Could we put the response from um, uh, the, um, I forgot the name, but you know, that deals with. Um, Land registry? No, tr uh, transfer. Trans oh, I've lost it completely. Uh, <laughs> with uh, transacting property sales, could we right. put that? Could we put that on the agenda for next week's meeting mm -hmm. to have another look at that? I'd rather just nod it through. Yep. Okay. Yep. Get um, the name of the what is it? Okay. Land registry. Land registry. Yeah. Good yeah. yeah. Okay. Let's we'll move on to the forward work program. The date forward work program for April July is at page one seven one. Uh, advise members of the department has indicated that it wished to bring the vote on account and budget number two bills to the committee to the meeting on the 20th of May. Very important piece of work. Uh, members are content to receive. Ask members are content to receive oral evidence from the officials on the vote of account and budget, num budget number two bill on the 20th of May. Are we content? Please. Great. And ask you, are you content with the forward work programme as it sits? Sir, can I bring something up, not to prolong the meeting, but I think it's very important. <sighs> During the last number of weeks, I have been dabbling in the RHI Inquiry report, all three books, and there are, there are clearly issues within that report that really the Finance Committee should be dealing with, a regular spend being one. I'm wondering, because I can't remember off the top of my head, who is taking the work of scrutinising that report forward, and will it be a bit like Jim's Bell, split into different departments and different uh, committees to look at. Will the RHI inquiry be the same? Um, uh, ju just, to, just for clarity, then, it was interesting that the head of the civil service mentioned the fact that there was a committee that was being set up to look at implications for RHI. Yeah. Uh, maybe we could get a, an update, and I think we've already asked. Yes, the yeah, I think we've asking. already asked uh, where we are on that, and get a, a, a note from the uh, executive office on that one. You can check. Yep. But it was interesting that the second David, obviously, yeah. who's from finance, has some sort of oversight. Yeah, yes. yeah. Maybe yeah. we should probe with him a bit more. Yeah. 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 
Uh, any other business? I advise members that papers for committee meetings are due to be issued on Friday, which is a public holiday. Uh, Jim will work the endeavour to get the papers for next week's meeting by tomorrow evening, but it may not be possible to issue all the papers by then. And if members are content, should the need arise for our meeting papers for next week's committee to be issued on Monday? Content? Yes. Uh, we already discussed the National Crime Agency, but just so it's in the record, an email from the NCA was circulated earlier today suggesting they could meet through BTC. But I think we've agreed that we would rather meet them uh, on a day that wasn't a sitting day and it was more appropriate to uh, more appropriate to us rather than the NCA. Are we content? Yeah. yeah. Uh, members, any other business? Well done. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you very much indeed, team. And we are finished with one minute, 15 seconds to spare. <laughs> uh, the next meeting is 2.30 here in the, or 14.30 here in the Senate Chamber. Okay. Thank well you very much indeed. Thank you. Well done. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.